So in here I will go through the remaining slides of the Diagnostic Testing and Robust Inference lecture. I sort of highlighted the main sort of uh, content point about inference, how important it is that we know well, we are dealing with Gauss-Markov type error terms or autocorrelated or heteroscedastic ones. And here we'll just go through some of the technical details. So we, we learned before of how to test for heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation. So what are the con what are actually the consequences of having either of these? Where we mentioned in the lecture that our OLS parameter estimates will remain unbiased. So our model is that one. Okay, that was our model, and then of course the OLS parameter estimate is the well-known XPRIMEX inverse Y. So that beta hat will remain unbiased, but it will not longer be efficient. Okay, so that means if that is OLS, the variance of beta hat OLS may be, remember this is going to be a matrix, okay, a K by K matrix. If our X, if you have N by K, if you have X explanatory variables, that in some matrix sense, is going to be larger than some beta hat other, okay, some other estimate, which we don't know, but there is some other estimate which will produce a smaller variance. So that means this beta hat or less is no longer efficient. And more importantly, the formula for this variance, okay, the formula for this which we had previously written down as sigma squared x prime x inverse, that is no longer the correct formula. Okay, so equation seven is no longer the correct expression for the variance of beta hat. So A, it's not gonna be the smallest anymore, and B, it's not gonna be calculated like this. So it turns out that the estimator that can produce a smaller evident um, error uh, variance for the beta hat is, for instance, a GLS estimated generalized least squares, but we will not talk about that here in this lecture. So, okay. so how, but if that formula, which we just had, if this one here is not any longer the correct variance, then the question is, what is? the correct variance. So firstly, a bit of notation. We said under Gauss-Markov assumptions, okay, these were the Gauss-Markov assumptions, the variance of u was equal to uh, sigma squared times the identity matrix. If we allow for either heteroscedasticity and or autocorrelation, we can't simplify like this. The most general form is just this. Okay, apart from, you know, I had copy and paste, that is um, n minus 1 n, sigma n minus 1 n, the covariance between error term at n minus 1 and n. So we will have all sorts of values here. And generically, we shall call that omega. So that was just a little bit of notation. Now, as for what the actual formula for the variance of beta hat is, we need to start from this line. It's best to start from this line. Remember, beta hat all s is x prime x inverse x prime y. Now, if we sub in the model equation x beta plus u for the y, then we can eventually get to this Term. Okay, you should be able to do that yourself, and you've possibly seen that before. This is where we, where we, uh, if we form expectations, and we can see that this is an unbiased estimator. Beta hat is unbiased. However, what we are after is the variance of beta hat all s. So, for simplicity, we assume here that we have non-random x. Otherwise, the easiest way to deal with that would to would be to look at the variance conditional on x, okay? But nothing 
major really changes here. So we want the variance of all s, so that means we get the variance of the right hand side term. And that's what we have here. Now, that theta is a constant but unknown. But as it is a constant, so the important thing is the constant and therefore the variance of it is zero. So this term doesn't contribute, this term doesn't contribute to the variance. So what we are left, left with is, I'll just continue that here, is the variance of x prime x inverse x u. Okay, so that's what's left here on the right hand side. I'm just explaining how to get from here to here. I basically did a couple of things at this stage. So what we have here, how can we simplify that? Well, the key here is to understand that this bit is a constant. Okay, because we said we have fixed x's. So if you have, let's add a, add a quick, as a quick note, if you have the variance of a times x, and x is a random variable and a is a factor, then this is the same as a squared times the variance of x. Now how does that help us here? We will basically be able to just draw this constant out of the variance equation, but we need to square. However, squaring in a matrix sense, because this here is not a scalar, okay, this one is a vector, the squaring in a matrix sense is that we pre-multiply and post-multiply. And that's what we have here. Okay, so we've basically drawn that out, pre-multiplied and post-multiplied. And what we are left with is the variance of x prime u, that's what we have here, variance of x prime u, plus this term pre-multiplied, that's here, and post-multiplied, that's here. So then we drew exactly the same trick with this one. Okay, let me just write down what we are left with, the variance of x prime u. And now you need to recognize that this guy is a constant. And again, to get it outside the variance operator, we pre and we post multiply it. Now we should, of course, of course, we should post multiply with the prime version. Okay, so we'll do x and so x prime that comes out, and then x prime prime is the post multiplication. Prime prime will of course just cancel out. So we get this term and then we can take this away. And that's what you now see. So that's what you can see here. Okay, so this is how we turn this guy into this guy. So, and then variance of u that we had just defined, see variance of u, we had just defined that as omega. So that is now just omega, the variance of u. I should use a different color. Variance of u, that bit in the center here, is just the omega. So this is now the formula we have. Now, of course, you know that looks different to, to this formula here, which we said was the incorrect one. Now, how do we get there? Well, we get to this incorrect formula only, so only if, only if, this is valid, okay, if omega is equal to this, only then the variance of beta hat all s will simplify to sigma squared x prime x inverse, okay, but you've seen that calculation before, I'll just do this. So here we have just replicated the last line from the previous slide, so this is our variance this is valid generally, okay, even if we have heteroscedasticity and or autocorrelation. Now, of course, there's an issue that omega, this is unknown, okay, omega is unknown. So, as such, this is not implementable. We have the x, we have, that's just a matrix, but we need the, uh, the omega. 
So that means we now need an estimate of omega to make this workable. And there will be two different type of estimates. Okay, one which where the result then is called the white standard errors. Perhaps just as a reminder, I, I've done that before in the lecture. This guy, the variance or of beta hat or less is a k by k matrix. On the diagonal, we have the variances of the individual betas, the beta 1, beta hat 1, beta hat 2, and the square root of the diagonal, which is, if that's the diagonal, the square root of the diagonal, that will give us the standard errors for the beta hat i. Okay? So, and that's why we call the, the result for different implementations the white standard errors or the new west standard errors because we're usually interested in the standard errors and not in the off diagonal elements. So, but even if we are not interested in these off diagonal elements, that doesn't mean we can just set them to zero. And that's the issue. So, we will have either white standard errors or new west standard errors. These white standard errors should be used in the case of heteroscedastic error terms, the new West standard errors if you have autocorrelated and potentially heteroscedastic error terms. So the importance of using the correct standard errors or the correct calculation for the variance beta hat over less is that if you perform any sort of inference on one coefficient, we usually use the t-step. The t statistic and we can still use the t statistic so beta hat i minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error of beta i hat as long as that standard error of beta i hat remember that's what we said that's the square root of the diagonal of this matrix as long as this guy comes from the correctly calculated version, so from the white version, if you have heteroscedasticity, for instance. And if that is the case, then that t statistic, then we know the distribution of this t statistic, standard normal asymptotically for large enough samples. If we use an incorrect version of the standard errors, then we will not know what this distribution is. And so, if we use an incorrect version, version, that's an R, then beta hat I minus beta I from the null hypothesis divided by SE beta I hat, but now this guy coming from the incorrect version, okay, incorrect, then what about the distribution of this? Well, the answer is we don't know. And if we don't know how a test statistic is distributed, it's a useless test statistic because we don't know where to get critical values from. So first we'll briefly look at how to calculate the white right standard errors. So in practice, use OLS hack.m from the Eclair website or most econometric software packages have, have like a tick box where you can choose that you want to have right standard errors calculated. But I want you to know what happens at least roughly in here. Remember, if you have heteroscedastic error terms, then this omega, the variance covariance matrix of U, has st still has zero of diagonal elements, but it has variances which differ from each other. Now, of course, all these variances are unknown. However, ah, sorry, okay, so all of these are unknown. So the first thing I want to say is that we are really now first concentrating on this bit. X prime X inverse appears here twice. Now this, in practice, you have calculated this already for beta hat, okay, because beta hat requires X prime X inverse and then X prime Y. So in practice, you've calculated that already. So we really need to look only need to look at this center term. So of course we know we have the the axis as well, but what I want to show or what I want you to, to understand is that this term can be 
thought of as this summation. Now in the exercise, I will actually show this in detail. Okay, so I'm not going to do this here, but x prime omega x is the same as the sum of all observations of so, yeah, of sigma i squared times xi times xi prime. Just briefly, what's the xi? The x, and we did that on the board in the lecture, is basically x11. One, one. So in the first, we have the first x, and that we have up to n observations. Then we have x21, x22, all the way to x2n. Then we have k variables, so we have xk1, xk2, all the way to xkn. So this is our x matrix, and if we write all this as a vector, the first observation as a vector, x1, and the second for the, all the variables for the second observation as x2, and so forth, up to xn, then what we have is what we are using here. Okay, so the notation here refers to these row vectors. Okay, so here we have xi, that is a row vector, times xi prime, that's a column vector. So this guy here in the center is going to be k by k multiplied with a scalar, it's a scalar, then summed lots of k by k matrices summed up. That is still going to be a k by k matrix. Actually, let us just do that. That's k by k. And x prime x is k by k as well. k by k, and the inverse doesn't change the dimension. So all of these are k by k. Therefore, the result, as we know, is k by k. Anyway, so this is how we can deconstruct for that particular case of omega, that center bit. So let's do exactly the same thought experiment, or not thought experiment, exercise for the new West standard errors, which we know we need to use when we have autocorrelated and potentially heteroscedastic error terms. When I say and heteroscedastic, it means it takes care of heteroscedasticity as well. So Again, the same argument, we are looking at this center bit because the, for the general formula for beta hat, variance beta hat doesn't change. It's still this formula, okay? But now this center bit is going to be, it's going to look somewhat different, okay? The center bit, we had that green before. It now turns out that if our omega looks like this, we can deconstruct that term, that x prime omega x, into this, into this double sum, okay? Sigma ij, these are the terms from our variance covariance formula and the xi's and xj's which we had before, okay? Again, this is k by k. So, at this stage, we haven't really gained anything because that omega was unknown, but that means all the omega j, or all the sigma j i's, they are also unknown. So really at this stage we haven't gained anything, but these representations are important for what's coming. So here on the next slide we just see a summary of these two center terms, okay, for the two different standard errors. The difference comes through the off-diagonal elements. In a way this is a special case because if, so we move from here to here, if the sigma ji is equal to zero whenever i is unequal to j. Okay, in that case, that will simplify to this. That's why the white standard error is a special case. So what we need is, we now need to find estimates for these guys. Now that looks just a little bit, but remember for the normal standard errors we needed an estimate for sigma square. And what we used was the sample variance of the estimated 
squared residuals, okay, and we called that S squared, okay, and that sum was from I equals 1 to N. So that was, was what we used as an estimate for the unknown sigma squared if you had Gauss Markov type error terms. Now we need estimates for all these I's. Now let's think about in heteroscedasticity we are assuming that these sigma i squares can be different for all observations. So think about the fifth observation. Think about sigma squared phi for the fifth observation. In this case, for the Gauss-Markov errors, we just took all the relevant squared residuals and calculated basically the sample variance for it. And we took all n because we said the variance was constant. That means all the residuals were relevant for that one variance. Now we only have for sigma i squared hat, for instance, the fifth observation, we only have one relevant residual. That's the fifth, because we're assuming that the variance could be different for all observations. So therefore, what we're actually doing is we are calculating the sum of the i-th observation ui squared hat and that is going to be our estimate for sigma i squared. Okay, so we are using this. Since we only have one observation, we don't have to divide, well we have to forget about that n minus k, but we're just you know, and there's no sum, so we are just using that. But in, in essence, it's still a similar concept to what we use here. It's just that we are restricted to one relevant estimated residuals, the ui hat squared. For the next observation, for i plus 1, for instance, there's only one relevant observation as well, the ui plus 1 hat squared. So for the wide standard errors, we'll go to this formula and we will be just replacing the sigma i squareds with the ui hat squareds. Okay, so that's the important thing for the wide standard errors. So what we're basically doing is we're estimating the variance with one observation in this way here. Okay, really as a measure of the variance, this is not a very useful estimate. However, it turns out, and that's what White has demonstrated, that in the context of estimating, remember what we are after in the end is to estimate the variance of beta hat. And that is just sort of a little part of the calculation. And in the context of estimating this guy, this is a perfectly valid strategy. Now, that means if we now go to new west, so if we have established that we also have autocorrelated error terms, could we say, well, let's do exactly the same. Here we need the sigma ji instead of using for, for sigma i squared. We just took the squared residuals, but now we need estimates of these, of these covariances. Can we just use the cross product? of our estimated residuals. That would be sort of the straightforward equivalent of this strategy. And the answer is no. And why is the answer no? Well, let's assume we did exactly that. Then we would calculate, if you just replicate this equation, let me do, use a different color, this bit. And if we substitute this guy in there, what we get is this, okay, the double sum of these terms. Now it turns out, perhaps that's, that, that's possibly not immediately obvious, but you can establish yourself that this is indeed the case, that this is the same as this, x prime u hat, u prime u hat prime x. Now why is that of significance? Because recall this bit, okay, just half of this, x prime u hat what will that be? That will be exactly equal to zero by property of beta hat all s. Okay, it was one of the all s estimates properties that the estimated residuals were uncorrelated with the excess. 
So for, and that would imply that the variance for beta hat would be equal to zero, because if that center term is equal to zero, then the entire variance would be tied to zero. That's, of course, nonsense. That doesn't make sense, and therefore that is not a useful strategy. So, therefore, let me show you what has been, uh, let me show you what has been proposed as a fix to this dilemma on this slide. Firstly, on the top line, we can just see what we what we just discussed is a good strategy for wide standard errors. If you have heteroscedastic residuals, we replace the uh, sigma i squared with the ui squared hats, ui hat squared. Now for the new best standard error, what is done, and I don't really need to know you this, uh, I don't need you to know this by detail. Remember we have the double sum for the new vest standard errors. At some, there will be some terms where j equals i, okay? When we, and then we have sigma i squared times xi, xi prime, if the two indices are the same. Basically, what, we've, what has been done here, and I really don't need you to know any details, is that this part has been taken out, and then the, all the remaining bits are in the back here. And now what the practical implementation is that for the new vest, this first bit is exactly as for the white standard errors. But then there's going to be a second bit where we are basically looking at xi, xj primes and the transpose of this and our will proxy sigma ij with this ui hat, uj hat, but importantly what is done there is sort of a, a weight vector put in front of it, and that weight vector becomes smaller as the distance between the observations i and j increases, and at some stage that weight vector will indeed be zero. How many lags we need to go back for this to be zero, that's what the capital B here is, that's usually determined as a function of the sample size. But all of these details I don't need you to know. What I want you to know is what is done in the white standard error case and that the new vest standard error case is looks quite similar on first side, but that we have these extra terms which I don't need you to know in detail and they basically capture, so we include these ui hats and uj hats but they will only be included if that weight vector is not zero, and that weight vector is only going to be zero if the distance between these error terms doesn't exceed a certain value b. So we are basically taking into account some sort of covariance between ui hat and uj hat up to a certain order. If b was 5, we would be taking care of sort of correlation between residuals up to order 4, for instance. Okay, so that's what happens. So to wrap things up, and this is what we discussed in, in the lecture, the following. So if the error terms are heteroscedastic and we calculate the variance for beta hat all s using our white estimate, then this is correct. Okay, and that means we can then use a t-test and that is asymptotically standard normally distributed. Equally, if you have heteroscedastic and or autocollated error terms, and we use our new VEST version, the complicated formula we had on the previous slide, to estimate our variance for beta hat or less, then this is correct. And again, our t-test is asymptotically standard normally distributed. So let me demonstrate the importance of this. What we'll do is, I did that before in the case of the uh, tests for non-stationary series where I simulate data. I'll do exactly the same. I'll simulate some data. I have a multiple regression, so I have a yt and my explanatory variables are x1t and x2t. Uh, 
and then we have error terms and I use some coefficients here okay 0.5 for the constant 1 for beta 1 and negative 0.5 for beta 2. Now these error terms they will now come from one of three types of processes. The first one is going to be where the error terms follow the Gauss-Markov assumptions okay so they're IID independently in identically distributed with a certain variance, but that is constant. Second, I use error terms which are heteroscedastic. Okay, they'll, they'll all be normally distributed, but the variance here has a subscript and that means the variance will come will either be 0.1 or 0.02. And I I just have to check how exactly I did that. For half the sample, the variance was 0.1, and for the other half, it was 0.02. So the difference was a factor two, ah, oh, sorry, five between the variances. And the third process used autocorrelated error terms. Uh, in that case, the error terms followed an AMA11 process. We talked about AMA11 processes before with quite strong correlation actually. So what we then did, or what I then did, is we performed a t-test of this hypothesis, okay, the test that beta 1 is equal to 1. Now it turns out that is actually true, okay, so h naught is true. So that means we expect H naught to be rejected alpha times uh, alpha percent of times alpha it's an alpha percent of times okay because that basically that describes the size we're testing correct null hypothesis alpha controls the size and since we choose an alpha of 5%, so we would expect out of 10,000 simulations, 500 rejections. So what do we actually get? So here is the result. First, that was process 1, process 2, and process 3. So these processes change with respect to the error terms only. Everything else is exactly the same. And you see I did it for different sample sizes and then what I did is we performed a t-test using the normal OLS standard errors, then the white standard errors and the new vest standard errors. As you can see, if the error terms are Gauss-Markov, so everything is hunky-dory, then using the standard the normal standard errors for the beta hat produces really nice inference. Okay, even at small sample sizes, we get correct inference. These numbers we would expect around 5%. Okay, we are performing tests at a significance level of 5%, so hopefully our empirical rejections are around 5%. Perhaps I should explain this number here, for instance. That means that out of the 10,000 processes simulations at sample size of 50 with Gauss-Markov error terms using the normal OLS standard errors, turned out that we rejected the correct null hypothesis 4.79% of times. And it should have been 5, so we are pretty damn good. And you can see these numbers don't really depend on the sample size. If we have Gauss-Markov error terms and we use wide standard errors or new best standard errors for small sample sizes what you can see is that this number deviates from 5% quite significantly. The larger the sample size the better these values get. Okay so that means you can use the wide or new best standard errors 
even if you don't have heteroscedasticity or autocorrelation if your sample size is large enough. But it's not quite as good as the OLS standard errors. So what about the case where we have heteroscedastic residuals? Now, you can see that for the OLS standard errors, we're deviating quite a bit here from the 5%. Here, it turns out, we are getting fairly close to 5% for large sample sizes, but this is not a guarantee. Okay, For different sort of heteroscedasticity, this may not happen. The wide standard errors you can see for small sample sizes, they are not close to 5% either. But as the sample size gets larger, it gets fairly close to 5%. And as the sample size gets larger, that's important because we know that if we use the wide standard errors, then our t-tests are asymptotically standard normal. Okay, so only for large enough sample sizes that works. Now, if we have heteroscedastic residuals, we use the new West standard errors again for small sample sizes. We are we're pretty wrong. Again, this gets fairly close to 5% here, but I should tell you that there's no guarantee that we will get there. But for large sample size, we will get pretty close uh, to 5%. So if we have sort of an over-specified error term, like we are allowing for autocorrelation, although there isn't, it still works out all right. Okay, so asymptotically, this is still okay. Whereas asymptotically, this one, although the numbers here look fairly similar, this one is not okay. And now we'll go to the heteroscedasticity case. Again, what doesn't work? Well, for small samples, nothing really works. Okay, in this case, for small samples, actually, the OLS works better. Now you can see this guy is sort of all over the place. First, it's a little bit smaller, then it's much smaller, and now it's two and a half, it's coming up a bit, again a bit. But that may be more or less luck that we are still not too far away from 5%, but you shouldn't be using this. Now, if we look at the byte, and, uh, and let's look at the new vest, we know this is the correct standard errors for autocorrelated residuals. As we said, for small sample sizes, it doesn't work, but as the sample sizes get larger, we get close to 5%. Again, this makes sense because this is an asymptotic argument. The wide standard errors, they don't allow for autocorrelation. You can again, and you can see here again, we're a little bit all over the place. It goes down to 1%, 3%. It comes up to 4%, which is not dissimilar to this. But in general, this is not a good proposal. Okay, so if you have autocorrelated error terms, you really have to use the wide standard errors. Now, this simulation is not as clear as the theory tells us what it should be. Okay, and it's a bit of, you know, my interpretation and sort of the experience I have that contributes a bit to, to these guidance that you, you know, you can use over-specified value, over-specified ways to calculate the standard errors, so wide or new vest in the GM case, new vest in the heteroscedasticity case, but you shouldn't use under-specified standard errors, being the OLS, normal OLS standard errors in the heteroscedasticity case, or the normal OLS or the wide standard errors in the autocorrelation case. So that's really all I have to say.